to session on case based scenarios in medicine part 4 my name is dr janvi and i hope that all of you all are able to see me and hear me well please leave a thumbs up in the chat box if the streaming is okay and we can start with our class for today so just waiting for you guys to leave a thumbs up in the chat box and tell me that the streaming is fine Okay yes so the streaming looks looks absolutely okay so let's start with our class for today so welcome to an academy i am a mbbs md in anesthesiology i am a gold medalist in anesthesiology and this is the telegram channel where we will be carrying out all our uh notifications for the classes for the tests i have a lot of tests also which are coming up uh, currently i have shared all of them on the telegram group you can even win great amazon vouchers with those tests so please make sure to be a part of this telegram group on the 26th of february at 9 am in the morning we have the all india mock test for all of you guys so in this test you can Um, no where is your ranking amongst all your peers for uh, the neat pg exam this is absolutely freely available for all of you all you all can use my code dr janvi life to access this test and you will also get the solutions of this test at the end of it and we also have the combat test on the 19th of february at 6 pm this is very exciting because you can win extremely good prizes in this not just amazon vouchers but even a tablet or a smartphone and the plus subscription on an academy will help you get access to both live and recorded classes you can learn from india's top educators the iconic subscription is a partnership between an academy and prep ladder and that will help you get the access to both prep ladder's uh, recorded videos and an academy's live videos along with their question banks these are our neat pg toppers and these are the educator curated test series that we have for each and every subject Uh, in our special classes if you want to try out an academy you can come you can attend the classes you can get a pdf of the classes we have all these batches going on right now the target next 2023 subject wise batch the neat pg 2022 all educator revision batch the focus fmg comprehensive batch focus fmg december comprehensive batch and you can see that we have slashed the prices of the neat pg subscription and we also have slashed the prices of iconic subscription and this is something that i really wanted to tell you about is that on the 18th of this month this is the test that i have curated for you all it is a subject wise anesthesia test and trust me the questions are very simple if you keep coming for my classes you will be able to answer all those questions and rank one can actually get a 5000 rupee amazon voucher okay and if you would like to join the plus subscription you can use my code dr janvi live with which you will get 10% off on your subscription so with that let's begin with our first question for today a 65 year old man during his morning walk suddenly clutches his chest and falls to the ground he is sweating profusely and he is not responding the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient is call for help check for pulse for 10 seconds verify scene safety or begin chest compressions so what do you guys think is the answer for this mulla is saying answer is c chapagadi is saying answer is d the rest are all saying c okay very good absolutely correct so whenever you have this kind of a situation you have to go as per the guidelines of acls okay so here it is not advanced in fact it is basic life support so what is the main difference between basic life support and advanced cardiac life support this is what is the first thing that you should know when to use bls guidelines when to use acls guidelines so remember acls guidelines involves giving drugs to the patient like adrenaline giving defibrillation to the patient so you need to have a defibrillator with you and the third thing is airway management okay so if these things are not present and 
फोर्थ इम्पॉर्टेंट थिंग इज एक्सपर्ट हेल्प ऑब्वियसली only a doctor or a paramedical staff trained in doing all this will be able to carry out all the steps of acls okay bls is something which as a lay person you can give basic life support so this is an example of bls now when you are walking on the road definitely you are not moving around with a defibrillator and a bunch of drugs correct so what you can do is help and give bls as compared to giving acls so the first step of bls always is to verify scene safety so if this person has fallen on the road what are you supposed to do the first thing you're supposed to do is take him to the side of the road why because if you keep him in the middle of the road only and you start resuscitating him over there some car will come hit both of y'all and we'll require bls for two people not one okay so the first thing to do is verify scene safety so always go whenever they ask next step in management of bls you should first say verify scene safety okay then the next step after verifying scene safety is to check for response in the patient why is this important imagine you feel that someone has had a cardiac arrest but instead you tap him and uh, you shake him up a little bit and you find out that he is actually an alcoholic who is uh, very nicely sleeping on the ground after drinking a whole bottle of alcohol so popat ho jayega udhar correct so you're supposed to check for response in the patient or maybe he's just hypoglycemic and he's fallen down or he's had a sun stroke and he's fallen down okay so first you need to tap the patient check for response if there is no response the next step that you will do is call for help okay so you'll call for help around you asking the passers by close by to help you and the second thing you do is call for help to the ambulance also so that you also have expert help and defibrillator ready okay once call for help is done then you have to check for pulse and you have to check for respiration okay so when you are checking for pulse in these patients remember you have to check only for the central pulses so central pulses are basically your carotid pulse or your femoral pulse and you should not check for pulse for more than 10 seconds okay at least 10 seconds and not more than 10 seconds also so you have to check for pulse for 10 seconds once you cannot find the pulse and simultaneously look for respiratory chest movements if you cannot see respiratory chest movements also then you will go ahead with start chest compression to ventilation and start ventilation okay and this is given in the ratio of 30 is to 2 and once the help arrives then you guys can um give over to the acls team and they can intubate the patient or they can start giving iv drugs to the patient whatever is required for that situation okay so if we see over here he has clutched his chest fallen to the ground he is sweating profusely the only thing they have given over here he is not responding what is the next step so first thing you will always do is verify the scene safety and then already they have given that he is not responding okay so after that the next step would be to call for so that is the answer over here always go as per the guidelines as per the steps given exactly by bls all right okay moving on to our next question a young male patient is posted for inguinal hernia surgery on inserting spinal anesthesia he collapses suddenly his pulse is feeble and his bp is 60 by 40 mm of hg the most appropriate next step in his management would be administration of inotropes administration of vasoconstrictors chest compressions iv fluid bolus or both b and d okay so faiz is saying answer is c ayush is saying answer is e mulai is saying answer is d Staphylococcus is saying answer is E. Okay. All right, guys. So first of all, I'm sorry for coming a little late. Actually, I got late from the hospital. The class was supposed to be at six thirty, but uh, I got a, I got slightly late at the hospital. So that's why I'm starting it at seven. Tomorrow's class is also at six thirty p.m. I'll definitely try to be on time. Okay. All right. now let's have a look at this question. So whenever you give spinal anesthesia, this is your spinal cord. these are your spinal nerves correct so when you are giving spinal anesthesia what are you doing exactly you are depositing local anesthetic in the subarachnoid space 
okay now the spinal nerves that you are blocking with the spinal anesthesia is nothing but your lumbar spinal nerves okay you give spinal anesthesia around the lumbar spinal nerves now remember your lumbar spinal nerves form what part of your autonomic uh, uh, nervous system so basically your thoracolumbar spinal nerves form a part of your sympathetic nervous system so if i am blocking the sympathetic nervous system then what do i get in that case i will get a fall in the blood pressure of the patient okay so whenever i give spinal anesthesia to the patient there will be a fall in the blood pressure of the patient because of blockade of the sympathetic nervous system so if i want to bring the blood pressure of the patient up then what should i give i should give vasoconstrictor because there is vasodilation so i should give vasoconstrictor to make sure that the bp comes up okay so that is one of the things the second thing is suppose first my blood vessels were like this then because of the spinal anesthesia and loss of sympathetic tone they have become dilated like this okay now if i want to bring up the blood pressure in this i can also increase the amount of fluid that is present in these blood vessels so that will also fill up the blood vessels increase the venous return and that will also increase the bp okay so both of these things can be done i can give vasoconstrictors also and i can give iv fluid bolus also in fact both should be done simultaneously so the answer here will be both b and d now if you look at the question very carefully i have given you that a young male patient is posted okay so why i have I specifically mentioned that if you have an older patient who has a cardiac disorder okay if his heart is not pumping very well in them i will give guarded fluid therapy so here i would not prefer to give iv fluids i would just prefer to give the vasoconstrictors to increase the blood pressure of the patient but in this young male i can give him both fluids as well as vasoconstrictors so the answer here will be both b and d all right so if they mention any contraindication for giving excess fluids you should go only for vasoconstrictors if there is no contraindication then you can go ahead with uh, fluid therapy all right uh, sorry you can go ahead with vasoconstrictors and fluid therapy both now moving on to our next question a patient develops severe asthmatic attack and bronchospasm which of these inhalational agents would be most helpful in this situation iso sevo des or halo okay none of you all are answering this question correctly all your answers are wrong सबके आंसर होंगे ओके सो ओनली इन सम फैसल हैज आंसर्ड दिस करेक्टली नाउ व्हाट आर दे ट्राइंग टू आस्क यू ओवर हियर देयर इज सीवियर एस्थमेटिक अटैक एंड देयर इज ब्रोंकोस्पाज्म सो टू रिवर्स दिस यू नीड टू गिव एन एजेंट दैट विल कॉज ब्रोंकोडायलेशन ओके so what is the best agent to cause bronchodilation the best agent to cause bronchodilation is halothane okay remember what does halothane do halothane is a smooth muscle relaxant halothane causes smooth muscle relaxation so whenever it causes smooth muscle relaxation it leads to vasodilation okay and it leads to vasodilation it leads to bronchodilation it leads to dilation of the uterus so wherever smooth muscles are there halothin will lead to the smooth muscle relaxation and dilation so if you want to carry out bronchodilatory properties then your halothin is always the first choice after halothin suppose this is not given in the options then your second answer would have been the sevoflurane okay which agent would be contraindicated just remember the agent that would be contraindicated would be desflurane okay why because desflurane is actually having an irritant effect it has a very pungent odor and it has an irritant effect and as a result of this desflurane actually leads to more spasm as compared to 
release of the spasm okay so as a result of this halothin will always be your first choice and second choice will be sevoflurane yes i know a lot of books give sevoflurane as first choice that's because nowadays halothin's use is not as much as it used to be before but still if you have to compare between the smooth muscle relaxants halothin is always much much better at smooth muscle relaxation and bronchodilation as compared to sebo okay all right okay so since we are on this topic can i ask you one question each as per the options so the options remain the same and the next question that i wanted to ask you guys is if i have to prefer an agent for inhalational induction out of all of these four options if i have to prefer an agent for inhalational induction in children which is the agent that i should use Okay, so I think there is a big delay between me talking and you guys actually getting the relayed answer. So I will go ahead with the next question. All right. Okay, so for inhalational induction in children, we will prefer to give sevoflurane. Yes. All right. Next question. A forty-year-old woman underwent surgery and recalled events post waking up from anesthesia. Which monitor is used to check awareness under anesthesia? Sensory evoke potential, brainstem auditory evoke potential, ETCO2 or BIS. okay so most of you all have mentioned this correctly yes so the answer for this is bis or bispectral index okay so can anyone tell me in bis or bispectral index what is the ideal or correct range that has to be maintained just tell me i'll come back in one second any idea okay so what is bis bis is nothing but it is a monitor which checks the depth of anesthesia okay so it is a depth of anesthesia monitor so what do you do in bis so basically if you see it gives you a number between 0 and 100 and what does it check it checks your eegs eeg eeg is nothing but electroencephalogram so the spikes coming from your brain they are checked and the electroencephalogram is checked and it gives you a reading between 0 and 100. So the ideal BIS to be maintained is between 40 and 60. So if the patient is maintained within this BIS value, that means the patient is completely deep and it is good. He has a good uh, depth of anesthesia. Okay. Now, if the patient is between 60 to 100 on the BIS monitor, that means your patient is actually aware. So even though he looks like he's sleeping, he will be able to recall events from the surgery. He will be able to remember what the surgeon said, what the anesthetist said. Okay. On the other hand, if the range comes between 0 to 40, that means the patient will be very deep. Very deep under anesthesia. So this is also not recommended because the patient's hemodynamics will fall. So his BP... Uh, and his heart rate everything will fall you don't need to be in that range of depth also okay so 40 to 60 is the ideal range of bis that has to be maintained the full form of bis is nothing but bispectral index anyone any idea when do we use evoke potential monitoring for what are evoke potential monitoring use can anyone tell me there is no instrument for bis the name of that monitor only is bis Okay, so evoke potential monitoring is basically a specialized type of neuromonitoring. 
okay so what do you do in evoke potential monitoring is that um, suppose a part of the brain has to be cut out and you want to make sure that the functional capacity of the patient is not affected even after cutting out that part of the brain so you stim keep stimulating it throughout the surgery and keep looking for the functional response so that you know that this is close to the part where you're removing and you save that part so that the patient's functional response remains okay so as a result of this what you do is evoke potential monitoring especially using neurosurgery or neuroanesthesia okay all right moving on a tracheostomized patient with portex tracheostomy tube in the ward develops sudden complete blockage of the tube his saturation has dropped to 50 percent which of the following is the next best step in the management immediate removal of the tracheostomy tube and jet ventilation suction of the tube with soda bicarb attach oxygen through hudson mask or mass ventilate the patient with 100 percent oxygen Okay, so Mulai and Ravi Kumar are saying that the answer is A. Any other answers? Okay, so the correct answer over here is A. That is absolutely right. Now, let's have a look at what do you mean by all of these options. So, please pardon my horrible drawing. But if you look at the patient, okay, I'm going to draw a long neck. Imagine that this is the trachea over here. And your tracheostomy tube is going inside like this. Okay, so tracheostomy tube is always from the front of the neck. So it's going inside like this. Okay, so this is your tracheostomy tube. Now, the tracheostomy tube is inflated to fill into the, fit into the trachea. Okay, now if you look at this, what is happening exactly over here? The tracheostomy tube is completely blocked. So you are not able to ventilate the patient. Okay, so if I attach a Hudson mask over here, or if I hold a mask and bag mask ventilate the patient, even then this part, the air, whatever oxygen I give, it will go in the oral pharynx, then it will go into the trachea and it has to go down into the lungs, correct? But this part is completely blocked by the blocked tracheostomy tube. So there is going to be no oxygen that will go inside the lungs as long as I do not remove this tracheostomy tube. Okay, this tracheostomy tube over here is closing the passage of the trachea and it is completely blocked so whatever i do from above is not going to be helpful at all so i cannot mask ventilate i cannot attach a hudson mask it is not going to help the patient now can i suction the tube with soda bicarb this is something that they used to follow before they used to say if you put soda bicarb in the tracheostomy tube and try to suction it then there could be some amount of um, clearance of the blockage but now they say that that is also not very useful. So the best thing that I can do for this patient is to remove this tracheostomy tube. Okay. So once I remove the tracheostomy tube, the tracheal passage will be clear again. And then I can mask ventilate the patient and the oxygen will go into the lungs. So what is jet ventilation? Many people ask what is jet ventilation? Jet ventilation is nothing but you have a small shower like thing. Okay. It's very thin and it gives oxygen at very high pressures directly into the trachea so wherever is my tracheostomy tube i remove the tracheostomy tube from the front of the neck i pass the jet ventilation through the same uh, hole that have created in the neck and it will go into the trachea and i can give high oxygen at high pressures so that the patient's oxygen levels come up okay so that is what is jet ventilation okay so the answer for this is remove the blocked tracheostomy tube and jet ventilate the patient Moving on to our next question. A 34-year-old housewife reports a three-month history of feeling low, lack of interest in activities, lethargy, multiple body aches, ideas of worthlessness, decreased appetite and disturbed sleep with early morning awakening. She is likely to benefit from antipsychotics, antidepressants, anxiolytics or hypnotic sedatives.
Okay. Very good. So, can you all tell me what is the diagnosis of this disease? Anyone, what is the diagnosis of this disease? Yeah. So, this, the diagnosis of this disease is nothing but the patient is suffering from clinical depression. Okay. So, she has a low mood, lack of interest in activities, lethargy, and then these are the somatic uh, changes in the patient, body ache, worthlessness, change in appetite, change in sleep. Okay. So, all of these give the diagnosis of clinical depression in the patient and also the timeline is important. So, she has completed three months of these kind of um, uh, symptoms. So, definitely this falls in the category of depression. So, you will start this patient on antidepressants. All right. Okay. Moving on to our next question. A 31 year old male with mood disorder on 30 mg of haloperidol and 1000 mg of lithium is brought to the hospital emergency room with history of acute onset of fever, excessive sweating, confusion, rigidity of limbs and decreased communication for a day. Examination reveals tachycardia, labile blood pressure and investigations reveal increased CPK enzyme levels and leukocytosis. He is likely to have developed what? Lithium toxicity, tardive dyskinesia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome or hypertensive encephalopathy. Okay, so most of you have answered this question correctly. A few of you are confused between lithium toxicity and neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So that is understandable because the two drugs that I've given you over here is haloperidol and the second drug is lithium. Okay, so the problem is with either of these drugs. I absolutely agree with you. Now, what, how do you recognize what is going wrong? Okay, so if you look at this, it is, if you look at the drugs that are being given, Either it has to be lithium toxicity or because of the haloperidol antipsychotic agents, you could have neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So, two things I can rule out. Once I've ruled out two things, this is not an easy question. It's quite a difficult question. Okay. Once I've ruled out the two things, now I go to the symptoms of the patient. So, what is the patient having? The patient is having fever. Okay. So, there is a rise in his temperature. He is having excessive sweating, maybe because of the rise in temperature only. Confusion, rigidity of limbs. So, this is something which is very important. That is rigidity of limbs. And the second thing is, uh, there is increased CPK enzyme levels. Okay. So, if you are having muscle rigidity and you are having increased CPK levels, what is the problem that we are facing over here? that the patient is having muscle rigidity and the muscle is breaking down and because of the breakdown in the muscle what are you having you are having rise in creatine phosphokinase so basically they are trying to tell you that this is nothing but rhabdomyolysis rhabdomyolysis okay so if you are having hyperthermia and rhabdomyolysis these two symptoms are seen in two diseases one is malignant hyperthermia which is seen after exposure to anesthetic agents. The second is neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which is seen after exposure to antipsychotic agents. So, the exposure over here is to haloperidol, which is an antipsychotic agent. So, these are features of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Okay. So, this is how you need to diagnose. It's Trust me, this is not an easy question. This is a difficult question. So, for those of you who got it correct, very well done. And that's why you should come for my Amazon, uh, my class on uh, my test on 18th of February. And in that, we will be having questions like these. But you, if you can pass all these questions, you can get an Amazon voucher for 5,000 rupees. All right. Next question. A 23-year-old engineering student is brought by his family to the hospital with history of gradual onset of suspiciousness muttering, smiling without clear reason, decreased socialization, violent outbursts and lack of interest in studies for 8 months. Mental status examination revealed a blunt effect, thought broadcast, a relatively preserved cognition, impaired judgment and insight. He is most likely to be suffering from. 
डिल्यूशनल डिजॉर्डर डिप्रेशन स्किजोफ्रीनिया और एंगजाइटी डिजॉर्डर ओके वेरी गुड सो एक्सेलेंट मोस्ट ऑफ यू हैव आंसर्ड इट करेक्टली सो वॉट इज दिस पेशेंट सफरिंग फ्रॉम ही सफरिंग फ्रॉम स्किजो प्रीमिया ओके सो नाउ लेट्स हैव अ लुक एट वॉट आर ऑल द सिम्टम्स ऑफ स्किजो प्रीनिया एंड वॉट हैव दी गिवन ओवर यूर सो दीज आर ऑल द पॉजिटिव एंड नेगेटिव सिम्टम्स ऑफ स्किजो प्रीनिया डिल्यूजन हेलूसिनेशन डिसऑर्गेनाइज स्पीच फ्लैट एंड इफेक्ट रिड्यूज स्पीच एंड लैक ऑफ इनिशिएटिव सो इफ यू हैव Uh, if you read over here, what do you think this patient is having? He is having suspiciousness, muttering. Okay, so basically, decreased socialization. This is a negative symptom. Violent outburst, positive symptom. Lack of interest is negative symptom, and he has a blunt effect. So he is not having any emotional reaction. That is what blunt effect means. So that is also a negative symptom. Thought broadcasting. So what does thought broadcast mean? if i tell in some something okay so he will feel that 10 other people are able to hear what we are talking about or what we are thinking about okay so that is called as thought broadcast and impaired judgment and insight so all these uh, also the suspiciousness muttering is more telling you about hallucinations okay so this all these effects are telling you that the patient is suffering from schizophrenia all right Okay, moving on to our next question. A 30-year-old met with an accident and had a severe head injury. His GCS is six, and he has to be taken for emergency surgery. Which agent would be preferred for induction of anesthesia? Thiopentone, propofol, ketamine, or methoxyacetal? Okay, I don't know why in anesthesia most of you all make mistakes. These are all simple questions from anesthesia. You should be knowing all these agents of choice in one second only. So what are they asking you over here? Basically, they are telling you that there is head injury, correct? So if this patient is having head injury, what is the problem? He can be having raised ICP because of the bleeding in the brain. Okay, so whenever you have raised ICP. what is the problem that the patient can have intraoperatively he can start getting seizures so you need to have an agent which will decrease the intracranial pressure and it will also be anti epileptic in nature so out of all of these agents what is the best agent of choice the best agent of choice is thiopentone now of course propofol also decreases the icp methoxyacetal also decreases the icp but if you are looking for an anti epileptic agent something that will reduce the intracranial uh, so something that will reduce the chances of getting seizures then that is only thiopentone okay so remember any kind of neuro surgery you will go for thiopentone sodium as the induction agent of choice propofol can be used in all other surgeries no problem with that okay which is the agent out of all four of them that will be contraindicated for this patient any idea contraindicated yeah so contraindication will be ketamine because ketamine leads to rise in icp along with that it can lead to hallucinations and it can also lead to delirium in the patient and it can also cause seizures in the patient so ketamine is something that will be absolutely contraindicated in this case methoxyacetal is actually pro epileptic it actually induces seizures and this is the property of methoxyacetal that we use whenever we give ect electroconvulsive therapy or shock therapy in case of depressed patients so in that you want to induce a seizure so that you have increased dopamine production in the brain so in ect that is the time that we give presence uh, uh, in ect we prefer to give methoxyacetal okay but however that is not the question that is being asked over here you are asked what is the neuroprotective agent 
to be given in this case okay all right moving on to the next question ramo is on maintenance therapy for mdr tb he is to be operated for an inguinal hernia repair which of these blood tests is of particular importance to the anesthetist renal function test liver function test coagulation profile or esr all right so if you look at this case scenario what does it tell you he is taking akt correct he is on anti cox therapy for mdr tb now what is the surgery to be done the surgery to be done is inguinal hernia repair so in a patient who is on akt what is the most common organ to be affected so in a patient on akt the most common organ to be affected is the liver why is the liver so important for us the liver is important because if the patient is undergoing any kind of surgery all the anesthetic drugs that we give okay all the anesthetic drugs they get metabolized in the liver most of them like 90% of them get metabolized in the liver so now suppose because of akt his liver is damaged then in this case this patient is going to wake up from anesthesia very late so i don't want delayed recovery from anesthesia so before that only i want to check whether the liver is working properly or not so how do i check whether the liver is working properly or not i do liver function test in this patient who is on akt and then i decide with my therapy suppose this patient you see that his lfts are deranged okay so let me ask you guys a question if his lfts are deranged what will be your muscle relaxant of choice what will be the neuromuscular blocking agent that you will give in this case what will be your muscle relaxant of choice so that this patient does not have delayed recovery from anesthesia any idea so you need to give a muscle relaxant which does not get metabolized by the liver in fact it should get metabolized on its own so the muscle relaxant of choice will be either atracurium or cis atracurium okay so both of these they degrade on its own by a method which is called as hoffman's elimination okay so hoffman's elimination is nothing but degradation of the drug in the plasma itself so you can give agents like hoffman's elimination to the patient okay all right next meenu is on oral contraceptive pills since 10 years she is scheduled for a hip replacement surgery how should the oral contraceptive pills be managed pre operatively stop on the day of surgery continue peri operatively stop 4 weeks prior to surgery or stop post operatively okay so very good most of you have answered this question correctly that you will stop 4 weeks prior to surgery so whenever we are talking about oral contraceptive agents then how do you arrive to the conclusion in this case okay so when should you continue when should you stop so there are some rules that are given about oral contraceptive agents now what is the problem with oral contraceptive agents they are pro thrombogenic in nature okay so they are pro thrombogenic or pro thrombotic whatever you want to yes shweta definitely i'll answer your question i'll tell you about what medications to be stopped okay so whenever you have patients who are on oc pills they have high chances of developing deep vein thrombosis so what will you do you look at the type of surgery that she is going to undergo so she is undergoing a hip replacement surgery so if she is undergoing a hip replacement surgery 
then this patient is going to be immobile for some time after the surgery correct so what do you do in that case if the patient is going to be immobile after the surgery then you have to do a very simple thing you have to just say that because of immobilization also there are high chances of dvt so i will stop the oc pills prior to surgery okay so you stop the oc pills four weeks prior to surgery for example if minu was undergoing a simple surgery suppose she was undergoing a surgery for tubal ligation or she was undergoing a very simple surgery like a hernia repair in this case i know that patient is not going to be immobilized she has no extra chance of developing dvt so in these cases i would have continued the oc pills on the day of surgery okay so look at the type of surgery that the patient is going to undergo if there is any increased chances of developing dvt then stop the oc pills otherwise continue the oc pills okay okay so answering shweta's questions there are some medications that they ask continuously in the exam what to stop which to stop when to stop okay so the first set of agents that they ask is antihypertensive agents so remember all the antihypertensive agents can be continued on the day of surgery except ace inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers why ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers both of them will cause refractory hypotension what do you mean by refractory hypotension whatever drug you give to increase the blood pressure of the patient it will not act the blood pressure will always remain low okay so you should not be giving the patient ACE inhibitors or ARBs on the day of surgery other antihypertensives beta blockers calcium channel blockers uh, you can give all of them no problem okay next you have your anti diabetic agents as a rule of thumb unless they ask you anti diabetic agents should be continued or not overall for all the simple questions your ohas and insulin both should be omitted on the day of surgery why already your patient is fasting for long enough on the day of surgery plus if you give him oral hypoglycemic agents or insulin his sugar can go down even more and that can lead to hypoglycemia so to prevent that you should be avoiding ohas and insulin in what condition do you continue ohas or insulin i will tell you we have a question on that also ahead but overall if they ask you something as simple as should they be continued or not you will say no okay next class of drugs is thyroid agents now here i am talking about agents that are taken in both hypo and hyperthyroidism if the patient is on thyroxine or eltroxine for hypothyroidism or if the patient is on neomarcazole or carbimazole for hyperthyroidism all of them need to be continued on the day of surgery okay you want the patient to be absolutely in a state of homeostasis on the day of surgery so you will not stop any of the thyroid medications in fact you have to check the thyroid function test of the patient and they need to be normal all right okay moving on to the next question a 20 year old primi gravida had an epileptic attack in the morning she was diagnosed to have pih pih is nothing but pregnancy induced hypertension since two months what kind of anesthesia should be given for her emergency lscs on the same day final anesthesia epidural anesthesia general anesthesia or defer surgery as she had a seizure today all right so most of you are confused between b and c as i can see first of all you should remember that lscs lscs is a surgery which takes about 45 minutes to one hour okay so for this kind of surgery you do not need to give epidural epidural is given always when you have a long duration surgery okay so if you have more than two hours surgery if it's less than two hours you can simply give in spinal anesthesia only so LSCS lower segment cesarean section is never a long surgery so epidural is out of the question okay 
नेक्स्ट डेफर द सर्जरी एज शी एट सीजर टूडे दिस इज ऑल्सो नॉट वन ऑफ द ऑप्शन बिकॉज द पेशेंट हैज इज अंडर गोइंग एमरजेंसी एल एस सी एस यू यू कैनॉट डेफर द सर्जरी यू हैव टू डिलीवर द बेबी अदरवाइज द पेशेंट विल डाई ओके एंड द बेबी विल ऑल्सो डाई सो ओनली टू ऑप्शन ओवर यूर आर स्पाइनल एनेस्थीजिया एंड जनरल एनेस्थीजिया इन दिस केस सो हैव अ लुक एट द क्वेश्चन शी हैज हैड एपिलेप्टिक अटैक एंड शी हैज अ हिस्ट्री ऑफ पी आई एच सो दैट मीन्स दैट दिस पेशेंट इज हैविंग नथिंग बट एक्लैम्पिया ओके in a patient of pregnancy induced hypertension if she is having an epileptic attack that means she is having eclampsia so if she is having eclampsia what is the problem she will have a raised intracranial pressure if she is having a raised intracranial pressure what will you do in that case will you give ga or will you give neuraxial anesthesia remember the contraindication for neuraxial anesthesia like spinal or epidural is raised icp if the patient has a raised intracranial pressure your neuraxial anesthesia is absolutely contraindicated why so suppose this is the back of the patient and if i give put the spinal needle into the subarachnoid space and what will happen all the csf will come out because of the raised icp when the csf comes out it drains out it puts traction on the brain and the brain also tends to come down from the foramen magnum so that can cause coning of the brain and that is why in raised icp you will avoid any kind of neuraxial anesthesia it is contraindicated so the only option that you have correct option over here is to give general anesthesia to this patient okay so any patient who has had seizures on the same day go ahead with ga for lscs otherwise if they ask you for lscs what is the anesthesia of choice for any other kind of situation emergency or non emergency you will answer spinal anesthesia okay in emergency lscs for any other reason other than the patient having raised icp in any other case your answer will be spinal anesthesia eclampsia leading to seizure is because of raised eclampsia does not lead to seizure if a patient of pregnancy induced hypertension is having cerebral edema she can start throwing seizures and when she throws seizures that situation is called as eclampsia okay or right. a child is to be taken for supra condylar fracture fixation he is on formula fed milk after how much time can he be taken for surgery 2 hours 4 hours 6 hours or 8 hours ayush epidural is preferred in case of pregnancy in just two cases one is if you are giving labor analgesia to the patient i'll write it over here okay if you are giving labor analgesia that means if you are giving her pain relief uh, for during the period of labor so that is when we use epidural okay and the second is when you have a cardiac case in pregnancy okay so in that case you cannot give a uh, high dose spinal to the patient or you cannot just give spinal because it leads to hemodynamic instability so these are the two cases in pregnancy that you will put an epidural in you want to give labor analgesia and if the patient has any cardiac risk in pregnancy okay all right good so everyone knows the answer to this i hope so fasting timelines no in some if you are a expert anesthetist ga and spinal both can take less amount of time there's no nothing like that ki spinal takes too much time to happen okay all right so if we go about the fasting guidelines so 2 hours is the fasting guidelines for clear liquids 4 hours is the fasting guidelines for breast milk Six hours is the fasting guidelines for formula milk. Okay, and not just formula milk, also cow's milk. Or if the patient has had a light meal, light meal is like chai biscuit. Okay, and eight hours is the fasting guideline for a full meal. So if you have a full fatty meal, then eight hours is the fasting guidelines. Okay, so this is how. you guys should know the fasting guidelines for everything 2 hours 4 hours 6 hours and 8 hours so here we are talking about formula fed milk so fasting guidelines for formula fed milk is 6 hours all right okay moving on to our next 
question a patient with epidural catheter is complaining of back pain tenderness at the site of the catheter insertion and fever catheter is removed and sent for culture which is the most likely organism to be found in this case staph aureus staph epidermatis strep viridans or neisseria meningitidis yes very good all of you are answering this correctly so imagine this is the back of the patient okay and here i am i am putting a spinal over here and, and then sorry i put an epidural over here and i thread a catheter which goes into the epidural space okay now what is the organism that can soil this catheter so basically i can have staph epidermidis that is the one that is the most commonly found on the skin it can enter through the catheter inside and go into the epidural space and then from the epidural space it can spread up up to the brain and it can show something which is called as meningitis meningitis okay so because i am scared about this meningitis that's why i will prefer not to make sure that i maintain a lot of sterility whenever i'm putting an epidural catheter okay so in case of an epidural catheter if the patient is having back pain tenderness at the site and fever that means he is developing an abscess because of the epidural catheter okay so this is an epidural abscess now what is the worst thing that can happen with this epidural abscess imagine there is formation of pus and an abscess over here this abscess will grow in size and it will compress on your spinal cord and when it compresses on your spinal cord this patient will present with paraplegia he can lose the power motor power of both the legs so that is what i'm worried about and that's why i always want to avoid a epidural abscess what is the treatment you will have to debride or open up the skin and reach up to the epidural space and remove the epidural abscess okay all right a 35 year old covid positive patient has saturation of 83% on room air you put him on the ventilator what should be the tidal volume set for the same 6 ml per kg 7 ml per kg 8 ml per kg or 10 ml per kg okay yes so most of you are answering it as 6 ml per kg can you guys tell me on what basis are you answering it as 6 ml per kg as yes. what guidelines are you following over here correct so what are we talking about over here we are talking about ventilation in a patient who has covid okay now covid causes what changes in the lung it causes something which is called as ards acute respiratory distress syndrome okay so if you have to follow the guidelines for acute respiratory distress syndrome then in that case we have to follow something called as ards net protocol what are the uh, protocols given by this ards net study they say that the tidal volume of that should be maintained during ventilation is 6 ml per kg okay then you should be maintaining a plateau pressure in the lungs plateau pressure means pressure in the lungs at the resting state so plateau pressure in the lungs should not be more than 30 cm of water okay and you should adjust the paco2 permissive hypercapnia is allowed you can have high co2 levels in the body as long as you maintain a ph of more than 7.3 okay so this is your ards net protocol this is one of the important things with regard to covid and ards and that is why you should be knowing the answer to this all right simple question not very difficult
okay next one which of these muscle relaxants is the safest to be given during a renal transplant surgery vecuronium scoline atracurium or pancuronium Okay, very good. So all of you are who are answering this as atracurium, absolutely correct. Okay, so like I told you before, if there is any patient who is having any liver failure or liver transplant or liver is not working properly, that means there can be no metabolism over here. Okay, or if there is any patient with renal failure or renal transplant or any problem with the kidney that means there can be no proper excretion of the drug over here then you will try to go for drugs which automatically get excreted on their own so one of those drugs that we have is atracurium the second one is cis atracurium it is nothing but the cis isomer of atracurium only not anything different okay you have the cis isomer and the trans isomer of atracurium so atracurium undergoes something which is called as hoffman's elimination so Hoffman's elimination means the drug gets eliminated in the plasma on its own. Okay. So in Hoffman's elimination, you don't have to depend on the liver for metabolism. You don't have to depend on the kidney for excretion. The drug apne up at a set pH and at a set temperature will get metabolized and removed from the body. So at the end of surgery, the patient will not have any residual muscle relaxant effect. Okay. So that is why we give atracurium to this patient who has renal transplant. Obviously, if he's undergoing renal transplant, that means he must be having renal failure. Okay. All right. Now, another thing about atracurium that they ask commonly is what is the side effect of atracurium? So the side effect is that it causes excessive histamine release. So because of this excessive histamine release, the patient can have vasodilation. Okay. So this is the side effect of atracurium. All right. Okay, and this side effect is actually less seen with cisatracurium. So we prefer to give cisatracurium. All right. Next question: A patient is given rock uranium during intubation. The anesthetist is unable to ventilate him and wants to reverse the action of rock uranium immediately. Which drug should she look for? Neostigmine, lycopyrrolate, sugamadex, or both A and B? So I'll take 15 more minutes guys for this class. So hang around a little while. Okay, so there is a lot of confusion over here. I'm getting all three answers. Neostigmine, lycopyrrolate, sugamadex. No one is going for both neostigmine and glycopyrrolate. I don't know why. Hmm. Okay, so the correct answer over here is Sugamadex. Okay, now what is happening over here? Just see, I'm drawing the neuromuscular junction for you guys. This is the nerve. Okay, and what you're having over here is the muscle. And this junction that is there, this is your neuromuscular junction. Barabar. Now, what do you have over here? At the neuromuscular junction, at the level of the muscle, you have the acetylcholine receptor. What when you give rock uranium, the rock uranium goes and binds to this acetylcholine receptor and it will block the receptor. Barabar? Now, this is as soon as I give rock uranium. If after 45 minutes to 1 hour, I look at this same picture, what will happen is this rock uranium will go into the plasma, 80% of it will go into the plasma, and only 20% of it will remain attached to the um to the receptors acetylcholine receptors so to remove this 20 percent i will give neostigmine and glycopyrrolate those are the drugs that i will give that is called as reversal but this is after 45 minutes to one hour of, of giving rock uranium okay now what is my situation over here 
if you look at my situation over here it is completely different the rock uranium i have given it right now and i am unable to ventilate my patient so immediately i have to reverse the action of rock now this rock is not going to leave even if i give how much ever neostigmine it will not be able to remove this rock from the acetylcholine receptor so in that case i have to go for another drug to immediately remove the rock uranium so that drug is sugamadex so this sugamadex will go and it will bind to this rock uranium and it will remove this sugamadex rock uranium combination will be unstable it will leave this acetylcholine receptor and it will go into the plasma so if i want immediate reversal of rock uranium action i have to give sugamadex to the patient if i want reversal after 45 minutes to 1 hour then i can go for neostigmine and glycopyrrolate okay and this is the same for all non depolarizing neuromuscular blocking agents this is not just for rock uranium but also for vec uranium uh, not atracurium because atracurium gets eliminated on its own by hofmann's elimination but all other drugs rock vec pancuronium all of them can be removed by sugamadex immediately and if 45 minutes to 1 hour ke baad then by neostigmine and glycopyrrolate okay so that is the answer over here that you need to remember next question a patient with type 1 diabetes mellitus is posted for mastectomy she has uncontrolled sugars and the anesthetist wants to give her long acting insulin on the day of surgery how much of the insulin dose should be given in the morning half 1/3 1/4 or 1/10 okay any idea what is the answer over here guys remember i told you that if you have a diabetic patient okay whenever you have a diabetic patient as a rule of thumb ohas and insulin both of them need to be stopped okay whenever we have a diabetic patient as a rule of thumb oh is insulin both of them need to be stopped on the day of surgery because that can lead to hypoglycemia but what is the problem if you see over here they have given you a very specific question they are saying that patient is having uncontrolled diabetes and anesthetist yes he wants to give her long acting insulin on the day of surgery so they have not given you an option over here of skipping the insulin on the day of surgery okay in fact they have given you something very specific so sometimes when patients with uncontrolled diabetes what we do is that we continue the insulin on the day of surgery but of course we cannot give them the full dose because they are fasting so you need to adjust the dose in that case so how much dose adjustment is required so remember if the patient is type 1 diabetic autoimmune diabetes you have to give half of the original dose that the patient takes on the morning of surgery if the patient is type 2 diabetic then the patient needs to get get one third of the original dose on the morning of surgery okay but this is still a very specific uh, question if overall they ask you that should we continue or should we stop the ohs and in insulin you should always answer it as stop the ohs and insulin but if they give you a very specific question like this ki kitna dena hai kya dena hai and uncontrolled diabetes hai you want to give long acting insulin so in that case you can go with a more specific answer like this okay so only if you get a specific question like this you will answer it in this way since this patient is type 1 diabetic i will give half of the original dose of insulin okay all right going on to the next question a patient on antipsychotics is undergoing a muscle biopsy she is given entonox for pain relief she starts showing classical signs of hyperthermia hypercarbia and cola colored urine 
identify the disease. Febrile reaction to Endronox, Neuroleptic Malignant Syndrome, Malignant Hypothermia or Gutman Syndrome. Okay, remember in a type 1 diabetic patient, insulin requirement will always be more than a type 2 diabetic patient because in a type 1 diabetic, they are not able to produce insulin only. Okay, and in type 2 diabetic, insulin is produced, but there is peripheral resistance to it. So, in type 1 diabetic, the problem is more severe and that's why the amount of insulin that they will require is always a higher dose. That's why in type 1 diabetic, you will give half of the original dose and in type 2 diabetic, you will give one third of the original dose. Okay. All right. So, answering this question for you all, this is also something that I have asked previously, but here I have changed the wordings of the question for you all. So, I have made it a little complicated and I wanted to see how many of you all get it correct. But this is a simple common sense question and look at this the symptoms of course are of hyperthermia hypercarbia cola colored urine cola colored urine is because of the breakdown of the muscle okay so there is rhabdomyolysis over here so if you are having these three symptoms there are always only two diagnoses that is present one is malignant hyperthermia and one is neuroleptic malignant syndrome can anyone tell me gutman syndrome what is gutman syndrome any idea what is gutman syndrome Okay, now this definitely febrile reaction to entonox is something that is made up of, um, I have just made up that option, you all can understand that. Now you need to tell me whether this is NMS or whether this is malignant hyperthermia. So, what is the patient receiving? The patient is receiving entonox. What is entonox? Entonox is 50% oxygen plus 50% nitrous oxide. Okay, so... Does this have any of the inhaled anesthetic agents? No. Whenever you have malignant hyperthermia, what is the causative triggering factor of malignant hyperthermia? The triggering factor of malignant hyperthermia is inhalational anesthetic agents. So you need to have an agent like desflurane, sevoflurane, isoflurane, okay, or succinylcholine, okay. So the triggering agents for malignant hyperthermia are either of these. So if you look at our question, we are having no triggering agent of malignant hyperthermia over here. So your answer is nothing but neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Okay, the patient is already on antipsychotics. So that is how you can come to the conclusion that the patient is on neuroleptic malignant syndrome due to the antipsychotics that he is taking. Okay, so the answer is not malignant hyperthermia over here. Always look for the triggering factor. The triggering factor is absent over here. So your answer is NMS. All right. Okay. Moving on to the next question. Which of these maneuvers helps in opening up the airway? Head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust or all three of them? Okay, very good. So, I think all of you all have seen these maneuvers. So, whenever the patient is having a tongue fall or an obstructed airway, to open up the airway, the first thing that you can do is tilt the head. Okay, so you tilt the head like this. Head tilt. Next thing you can give is a chin lift. So, you can lift the chin like this. Chin lift. And the third thing you can do is a jaw thrust. You can thrust the jaw ahead like this. Okay. So, what are the maneuvers that help in opening up the airway? All three of them, head tilt, chin lift as well as 
your trust. You can use all of these three maneuvers. All right. Okay. A person comes to the casualty following a fight with his girlfriend who puts a knife through his chest. Heart rate is 110 beats per minute. BP is 100 by 70 mm of Hg. Saturation is 85%. This is is X-ray. What is the minimum amount of blood collected in the thoracic cavity? 100 ml, 150 ml, 175 ml or 250 ml? Hmm. Okay, so the confusion over here I can see is between 150 ml and 250 ml. Both the answers are wrong. Everyone who has answered as 150 and 250, both answers are wrong. Yeah, this is Valentine's special question. Absolutely correct. Girlfriend is saying you didn't get me Valentine's Day gift, so she puts a knife through his chest. Okay, so can you tell me over here what are you seeing exactly in the x-ray? Anyone who can diagnose for me what is wrong with the x-ray? Happy Valentine's Day to all of y'all. Okay, so what is wrong with the x-ray over here guys? Patao Chaldi. Plural effusion. If she has put a knife through his chest, will he get plural effusion? What is there over here? Of course, there is some collection in the thoracic cavity. And what is the collection? Nothing but blood. So she must have put the knife in some vessel over there. Okay, you have many vessels in the thoracic cavity. So there is nothing but hemothorax over here. Okay, so this is hemothorax. Now, what are they basically asking you? They are asking you what is the minimum amount of fluid that is that should be present in the thoracic cavity to give you the sulcus sign. This is the sulcus sign. Okay. So to give you the sulcus sign, what is the minimum amount of fluid that should be present so that you can see it on the x-ray. So the answer for this is 175 ml. Okay. So remember this in case of if you can see the sulcus sign on x-ray, that means there is a collection of fluid of at least 175 ml. All right. Okay. So now in this patient, an ICD is inserted. Obviously, there is hemothorax. You can see it. The patient's saturation is dropping. His BP is dropping. Okay. So, first thing is to put an ICD and remove the uh, blood that is collected. So, there is 1600 ml, 1 1.6 liters immediate blood in the ICD bag. What is the next step? So, in the intercostal drain, suddenly you are getting 1.6 liters of blood. So, what will you do next? Continue resuscitation with blood and blood product. Give tranexamic acid, CT thorax to assess thorax to assess complete damage or emergency thoracotomy. Hmm. Okay. Good. Most of you are answering this correctly. Absolutely right. Okay, so what are your indications for doing a emergency thoracotomy? That is what you should be able to answer in this question. Okay, to, so this, if there is sudden blood, these are your indications for emergency thoracotomy in a patient of chest trauma. Okay, in a patient of chest trauma, these are your indications for emergency thoracotomy. The first one is if there is blood loss of more than 1.5 liters suddenly. So, you've put an ICD, you have 1.6 liters suddenly coming out of it. So, there is definitely chest, excessive chest trauma. Second is if more than 50% of the thoracic cavity is covered by the effusion of blood. Okay, 
you can see over here 50 percent of the thoracic cavity is covered by the blood next is if you are getting blood in the icd bag at two more than 200 ml per hour okay so that is your next indication and the fourth indication is if there is hemodynamic deterioration so out of all of these four things you have got the first one that is in the icd bag you've got more than 1.5 liter of the blood so you will go ahead with an emergency thoracotomy and stop the further bleeding from happening all right last question for today an 80 year old patient is brought to the casualty after a fall in the bathroom he is unconscious his pulse is feeble his bp is 60 by 40 and the ecg is as follows what is the next step that you will do iv amiodarone iv metoprolol cardiac massage or cardioversion Look at the ECG, first diagnose the ECG and then tell me what is your answer. Okay, everyone is giving different different answers for this. First, can you diagnose the ECG for me? Yes, JJ. Okay. So, can you guys tell me what is the diagnosis? ECG diagnosis. Look at the ECG and tell me. I'll move my head away a little bit. Maybe you can look at the long lead to and answer the question. क्या है ECG diagnosis? Okay, so the diagnosis of this ECG is nothing but atrial fibrillation. बराबर? So this patient is suffering from atrial fibrillation. Okay, now in case of, you can see there are all fibrillatory waves in case of P waves. There are no proper P waves that you can see. So in this case of atrial fibrillation, what is the treatment? So remember, Whenever you have atrial fibrillation, you have to look at the hemodynamics of the patient. If the patient, I'll write it over here. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, if his BP and heart rate are fine versus if he is unstable. Okay. If the patient is hemodynamically stable, then what do you go ahead for? Then you will go ahead with A, B, C, D drugs. What are these A, B, C, D drugs? So that is amiodaron, beta blocker, calcium channel blocker and digoxin. Okay, so I will write down the drugs over here. Amiodaron, beta blockers, you can give either of them calcium channel blockers or digoxin. Okay, if the BP of the patient is unstable, he, so as you see in the question over here, his BP has fallen a lot. There is hypotension. It is 60 by 40 mm of Hg. So in that case, your treatment will be cardioversion. Immediately, you have to convert the rhythm from atrial fibrillation to normal sinus rhythm. So how do you do that? By cardioverting the patient. Okay. So in cardioversion, how much energy do you give? So you give anywhere between 100 to 200 joules, and it has to be a synchronized shock so it is synchronized and given whenever the qr is complex appears okay so it is a synchronized shock that you will give so this is how you take care of a patient with atrial fibrillation all right okay. moving on to our next question a man meets a high speed motor vehicle accident and has a sudden deceleration injury this is his x-ray what is the most probable diagnosis Rupture of the esophagus, rupture of the aorta, cardiac tamponade, or all of the above.
ओके अगेन ऑल डिफरेंट आंसर्स मोस्ट ऑफ यू आर आंसरिंग इट करेक्टली सो कैन यू गाइस टेल मी व्हाट इज द अपीयरेंस ऑफ द हार्ट ऑन दिस एक्सरे हाउ डिड यू डायग्नोस दिस एज कार्डिया टैम्पोना एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट and those of you who know the answer can you tell me what is the triad that the patient will present with in cardiac tamponade what is the name of the triad and what are the three things that are a part of the triad the name starts with b yeah so what can you see the appearance of the heart and tell me what is the name of the triad and what are the three components of that triad so the heart is enlarged there is enhanced ct ratio cardiothoracic ratio is more than 5 and the heart looks like a water bottle okay so this is also called as a water bottle heart so water bottle heart appearance is seen in case of cardiac tamponade and the triad that we get in case of cardiac tamponade is nothing but bex triad absolutely correct so in bex triad what is the three things that you get you get hypotension correct you get raised jvp absolutely right and very good sonu singh you get muffled heart sounds okay so this is our triad of bex okay seen in cardiac tamponade all right a 50 year old woman complains of difficulty in swallowing solids and liquids since one week she also complains of slight hoarseness of voice this is the picture on barium swallow identify the cause aortic regurgitation tricuspid regurgitation pulmonary valve stenosis or mitral valve stenosis yes very good so your correct answer over here is mitral valve stenosis so can you guys tell me what is the appearance that you see on the x ray as well as on the barium swallow and how did you come up to this answer why are all of you all answering mitral valve stenosis I know there is a delay in streaming, but it's not my problem. It is the YouTube server's problem. Evening time is the time when the maximum number of uh, YouTube videos are being recorded, streamed live. So there is always a server problem that we have. Yeah. So this patient is having difficulty in swallowing. Okay. That means there is a compression of the esophagus. also she is having complain of hoarseness of voice that means there is compression on the recurrent laryngeal nerve so what is it that can cause compression of on both of these if you see over here in the barium swallow you can see something is compressing on the esophagus and it's causing a constriction narrowing in the esophagus and if you look at the x ray you can see straightening of the left heart border over here in fact you can see an enlarged left atrium over here okay so this enlarged left atrium is the one is that is pressing on both your recurrent laryngeal nerve as well as on your esophagus and that's why it's causing these symptoms and why do you have an enlarged left atrium mainly the main cause for enlarged left atrium is nothing but mitral valve stenosis okay so because of these mitral valve stenosis the patient is having an enlarged left atrium and that is compressing and causing hoarseness of voice that is also called as ortner's syndrome and it is also compressing on the esophagus and causing difficulty in eating or swallowing that is dysphagia okay so this is nothing but mitral valve stenosis
so with that we complete today's class and today's set of questions i hope that you guys enjoy today's class i hope that you all further go and enjoy your day uh, today and i will see you guys tomorrow at 6 30 pm with the next set of case based scenarios uh, if you guys want any suggestions for the class you can message me on telegram i will be available over there but today we've had an excellent set of questions so remember all of you all who actually uh, have studied and are preparing for need pg this is a great way to revise your topics and little bit of using your common sense and english uh, reading capability also okay so this will help you in not just in revising the topics but also in applicability uh, yeah okay so thank you so much guys and i shall see you next time till then keep studying bye bye tomorrow at 6 30 pm that's the plan every day at 6 30 pm i will be taking the classes okay bye bye